Hi, my name is Brad Neal, and let's talk a little bit about Vesper. So Vesper is a way for us to think about molecular structure in three dimensions. Um, we live in three-dimensional space. Molecules exist in three-dimensional space. And when we write out Lewis structures, we make them look like they're in two-dimensional space. So they're easier to read. Um, but that's not really what they are. So Vesper is going to be a way for us to conceptualize through the three-dimensional geometries of what molecules really look like. It's going to stand for valence shell electron pair repulsion. Um, the best way that I can try to describe this is um, we're going to look exclusively at the valence electrons on uh, molecules and the atoms within molecules just like we did, did with Lewis structures. But now we're going to say in three-dimensional space, those uh, electron pairs, whether they're in bonds or whether they're lone pairs uh, around our atom of interest or our central atom, they are going to try to repel one another as much as possible. Um, so they are going to try to orient themselves in a way where they have the least amount of interactions as possible. Makes sense because they're little negatively charged particles, these electrons. Um, and so you don't want to put negatively charged things right next to one another. They just won't occupy the same space. So at the end of the day, we're trying to minimize those kinds of electron pair repulsions. So to determine a Vesper uh, structure, the first thing we have to be able to do is draw a Lewis structure out. Um, so if you can't draw a Lewis structure, then you're not going to be able to get the Vesper structure right. So go back and review the material for drawing Lewis structures. Secondly, we're going to count our electron regions and arrange them in a way that minimizes interactions around our central atom or our atom of interest. Um, but, and when we mean electron regions, we're meaning lone pairs or meaning bonding regions. So by doing this uh, minimization and pairing up these groups appropriately, so lone pairs and bonding regions, we're going to be able to determine our steric number. And the steric number is going to be a count of how many regions we have. That's going to end up giving us uh, an electron geometry. It says molecular geometry. It's probably better thought of as an electron geometry. Then, based off the steric number, we're going to be able to figure out what the molecular shape is or uh, molecular geometry. Um, and once we consider the number of bonding regions versus the number of lone pairs. Now, an important thing about this bonding region, when we're saying a bonding region, we're not saying, okay, is it a single bond, double bond, or triple bond, and then that adds a number separately. No, we're saying if you have a region that contains electrons and it is a bonding region, a bonding region means a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond. Any of those count as a bonding region. A single bond versus a triple bond, both of those are one bonding region. Um, in the case of something like carbonate, which we talked about in a previous video, uh, you have multiple resonance structures. What you're wanting to do is take your uh, resonance structures that have the lowest amount of energy, um, and we're going to use those one of those equivalent Lewis structures to predict what the structure of the overall molecule is going to be. So in the case of that carbonate, um, we said we were able to draw a structure out where we had three bonding regions around our central carbon and from the and, and there were three different ways we could write that out but at the end of the day it was really only a steric number of three around each of the around the carbon no matter what um, there's a way that you can visualize this with balloons um, but and that's something that's really fun to do when we're face to face because we're not really face to face anymore uh, i think a better thing to do is a simulation so after we go through the simulation, hopefully tables like what we've got on the screen are going to make more sense to you. Um, these kinds of tables exist in a variety of forms. So we have something that looks like this. We have something that looks like this. And I, pro I apologize. Um, I've been using this for years and I don't know where the attribution is for it. So I uh, apologize for not giving an attribution as well as this one. Um, the point being, there's lots of these different kinds of molecular geometry uh, sheets that will help you with things like 
um, your angles, your steric, uh, your properties of the molecule, such as what the name of the shape is, um, something that we're going to talk about later called hybridization. But in order for you to get any of these kinds of uh, sheets to work for you, uh, one of the key things you have to be able to identify is your steric number or the number of bonding regions around your central atom. Um, or I'm sorry, a number of your electron regions around your central atom versus how many lone pairs you have. So we're going to go back now to this first one that I showed you, and we're going to try to make sense of it in relationship to a simulation that we've got. So the thing that's a thing that's similar between all of these is we've got molecular geometry listed out here. Now the molecular geometries that are listed have some pretty basic names that are uniform. Um, and every one of these sheets is going to have the exact same naming or the same nomenclature um, as long as the sheet is right. It's not like, oh, it's a different sheet written by somebody else and so it's got a different name for whatever. You know, the names will stay constant. They're uniformly agreed upon. Um, and the names that you're looking for are linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, and octahedral. And these names all correspond to how many electron regions you have around a central atom. So let's do a simulation now and talk about this a little bit more. So this is a simulation off of the FET website. And right now we have it set so that it's going to give down here in the uh, lower portion of the screen, we're going to have it uh, denote what the electron geometry for our molecule is. Um, up here in the right, we can play with the bonding regions and the kind of bonding regions that we have, be they single bonds, double bonds, or triple bonds. Um, in a separate video, we're going to talk about the effects of adding lone pairs. Um, and then where my head is, there's the ability to click and show what our bond angles are. So we're going to go ahead and turn that on now. Okay, so let's go through this. In the case where we have a central atom, um, and we have two other atoms, two terminal atoms around it, and we have those two terminal atoms that are equivalent, we'll oftentimes see a nomenclature like we did on the PowerPoint of uh, the central atom being labeled A, and then the terminal atoms being labeled X, or maybe they're labeled E, or something along those lines. Um, that's just what that terminology is coming from. This idea that the terminal atoms for the sake of discussion right now, are the same kind of atom, um, and then our central atom is something else. If we have two terminal atoms around our central atom, the and the, if we're going to do valence shell electron pair repulsion, we're going to have these electron regions repel one another. So the way to get them as far away from one another as possible is to have them 180 degrees apart. Um, and that makes that should make total sense because 180 degrees is as far apart as possible as we can get these two electron regions from one another. Now, for uh, an illustrative purpose, if we remove one of these and we replace that with a double bond, okay? So now we have a single bond and we have a double bond. The double bond here is going to count as one region. The single bond counts as one region. So our steric number is still two, even though we have a double bond here. Our total number of bonds is three, but our steric number is two. And please note that the bond angle is still 180 degrees. Okay. So even if we have a double bond um, or if we put in a triple bond, it's not going to change the steric number. It's going to change the bond count, but it's not going to change the steric number. We're going to go back to just single bonds for the rest of these examples, though. Now, because this is a nice line, we give it the very exciting name of linear. If we want to include the molecular geometry, we will note that because we, uh, for this particular structure, the electron geometry is going to be the exact same as the molecular geometry. The molecular geometry is also uh, what I refer to as the molecular shape. Um, so what you'll find is that when you have no lone pairs around a structure or a central atom, 
the electron geometry and the molecular geometry or the um, electron geometry and the molecular shape, however you want to call those terms, they're going to be the same. So those two will stay the exact same until you um, put lone pairs in. And like I said, we've got a separate video for addressing lone pairs. Let's add in another bond now. If we think about putting another bond, it makes a lot of sense that, um, or it should hopefully make some sense to you, that the way that we can maximally spread out the electron density is to have the bonds now be 120 degrees apart from one another. Um, and so we have this kind of triangle thing that forms here. They are all in the exact same plane. If we spin this 3D molecule around, oops, don't grab the atom. If we spin this 3D molecule around, we're seeing that all of these atoms are in the exact same plane. So we're, because it's a triangle, we're gonna call it trigonal because it's all in the same plane, we're gonna call it planar. This is the way that uh, we can minimize those electron-electron repulsions from uh, our bonding regions. So our steric number is three, trigonal planar. What happens if our steric number goes to four? We have four, bond, four electron regions around our central atom. Now you might think that then our atoms are gonna shift such that um, we're gonna end up with 90 degree angles. But take a look here. We've got all this space above and below our central atom. There's nothing preventing our electron regions from reorganizing such that they minimize the amount of electron repulsion that they have. And so if we add one more single bond, we now have something that we can definitively see as three-dimensional. Now, if we draw out the Lewis structure for something like this, we're going to see we're going to draw it out flat and all of the angles are going to look like they're 90 degree angles. But truly what we have is something that ends up looking like this. And so we have 109.5 degree bond angles and we have one atom coming out at us right here. And if we move this, we have another atom that's going back away from us out here. If we make a, uh, theoretically, like we take one of our atoms here, this atom here, and this atom over here, and we make a uh, triangular face to this structure, if we do that for all of the possible combinations, so here, 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 the bottom ones and the back ones, we're going to have a structure that has four triangular faces to it. Um, because it has four faces to it, we're going to say that's a tetrahedral. So that's where tetrahedral is coming from. Um, now, if I were to ask you to draw something like this, this is not going to be the easiest thing in the world to draw right here for a lot of people, um, because not a lot of people's three-dimensional shading skills are on point. That's where something like in the um, graph that we, or the chart that we have here comes into play. So in this chart, we have uh, the ability to compare what we've already done so far. So I'm going to get this a little bit bigger. Okay, so we've talked about linear over here. Oops, we've talked about linear over here. And it's pretty easy to see how you could draw that in two-dimensional space. Trigonal planar, that's pretty easy to draw in two-dimensional space too because everything's in the same plane. All the atoms can exist in the plane of the paper. I would tell you, I would like to point out to you that when you go to draw these, it's generally uh, considered the right thing to do to draw the angle uh, on your paper, approximately what the angle of the structure should be. But let's go here to our tetrahedral now. So here's our tetrahedral. And let's see if we can maybe even get that a little bit bigger to show everybody. Okay, so here's our tetrahedral. The tetrahedral has this atom, this atom, and our central atom all on the plane of the page. What does that mean? Okay, so here's our molecule. Oops, let me try to get that oriented nicely here. Oh, come on. Nope. Oh, there it is. Groovy, kind of. Okay. Good enough. So we now have this atom up here on top. 
we have one atom over here and that's roughly when that's not roughly this one is 109.5 degrees and we said we have one atom going away from us back into the uh away from us into the screen and we have one coming out of at us uh in, you know from the screen we go back to our drawing now you can see how these almost if you squint just even a slight little bit they look like one another the x x uh these two are in the plane of the page but now with this wedge that we have drawn here um, the wedge is denoting that this atom is coming out at us and the dash structure that we have or the dashed line that we have here denotes that the atom is going into the page so this is what we call our wedge and dash method of drawing out these three-dimensional structures so this is a way to make this which is pretty hard to draw into something like this which is much easier to draw it's easier i'm not going to say it's easy but it's definitely easier the only way to get good at these is to do a bunch of practice okay so that's tetrahedrals let's go back to the simulation if we add one more atom now now we end up with this thing that kind of looks a bit like a jack um and there's a whole bevy of different angles now now i'm going to try to get the atom like this to start with okay so first off we've got from this top atom to these three atoms, um, these three are all in the same plane. Um, the this top atom, the central atom, and this atom here at the bottom are all in a line with one another. The ones that are in a line here, the top, the center, and the bottom, these are what we're going to call our axial atoms for our uh, structure here. The ones that are in the plane, we're going to call these our equatorial atoms. The equatorial atoms have a different bond angle than compared the to the axial versus an equatorial atom wait what okay let me get the drawing a little bit better uh there we go groovy okay so we've got this axial atom and compared to the equatorial atom here this is a 90 degree bond angle that also tells us that this axial versus this axial would be 180 degrees but what happens if we have an axial central, uh, I'm sorry, an equatorial central equatorial angle? So now if we look down the axis, so we rotate the molecule where we're looking down the axis, now we see 120 degree bond angles. So these 120 degree bond angles were what exist between our equatorial atoms. And we know it's the equatorial atoms because the axial atoms are 120, or I'm sorry, 180 degrees apart from one another. So as you might expect, drawing something like this gets even a little bit more complicated if you were going to try to draw it out three-dimensionally. But it's actually not more complicated than you might think. So now what we've got uh, blown up and what we're trying to highlight is this thing that we're calling a trigonal bipyramidal. And it's a tr trigonal pyramid if you take the equatorial atoms and one of the axial atoms and that makes a pyramid with a uh, triangle as its base and you can do the exact same thing on the bottom so trigonal by pyramidal because you can make two pyramids out of it um this is night this is how we would draw that out the key to drawing this out easily is to draw as many of the atoms in our molecule in the plane of the page as possible because that allows us then to draw as many bonds as just these little lines um, so this is a single bond this is a single bond this is a single bond or just a bonding region and then our wedge uh, coming out from a out to this X oops coming out from a to this X right meow that is coming out at us just like in the case of the tetrahedral the dashes going away from us are telling us that this atom is going into the page away from us so things to look for when you're drawing this are 90 degree angles and then it's kind of it is it's not kind of it is hard to draw 120 degree angle here 
but um, just kind of use a little bit of artistic license to draw it such that it's fairly obvious what you mean. Last one that we're going to worry about in general chemistry one is putting another uh, electron region in here. So now if we count this up, we have one, two, three, four, five, six electron regions. Our steric number is six. Okay, so this definitely looks like a jack if you've ever played with jacks. Um, characteristic here is all of our bond angles are 90 degrees. There's not gonna be equatorial and axial atoms in uh, molecules that have the name uh, octahedral unless the atoms are different from one another, unless our terminal atoms are different. If we had two, a terminal atom up here and a terminal atom down here that are the same, but then four right here that are different from those other two, yeah, we could then say we've got an axis. Um, but we don't typically do that. Uh, we're not going to typically see that in John Commissioner 1 anyways. So we've got now nothing but 90 degree angles. Um, and so if we can rotate this thing a little bit like this, that's where this drawing um, that we see is coming into play. So we've got our uh, atom here at the bottom, our atom up here at the top, and then we've got the four here around our central atom. This one's coming out at us, this one's coming out at us, this one's behind us, this one's behind us, and that is very much what looks like with our two wedges denoting this atom's coming out, this atom's coming out, and our two dashes saying this atom's going back and this atom's going back. So that is the gist of drawing out Vesper structures and the shapes that molecules are going to have based on the idea that electrons want to be as far apart from one another as they possibly can. Um, when they're around an atom. Now, these atoms that are these molecules that we've been showing you um, are fairly simplistic in terms of uh, they only have uh, one atom that's definitively the central atom of interest in all the videos or all the molecules we've shown that they've been purple. Um, and all the terminal atoms have been uh, the same exact kind of atom. Um, they've been all homogeneous. In real chemistry, there's most of the time you're not going to run into this in terms of these atoms won't be exactly the same, but we're not going to start you on learning how to ride a motor, uh, motocross uh, motorcycle. We're going to learn how to ride a bicycle, and this is the bicycle um, that we learn from. So this is the beginning of Vesper structures. This is where you're now going to want to go through, make sure that this these names make sense to you. You're going to want to review these various charts. Um, let's see if I can shrink this back down in some capacity at all. Oops, that's not doing it. You're going to want to spend some time on these charts um, trying to learn a lot of the names of these different structures. Um, so like with this one that we have here, uh, so the linear trigonal by bi trigonal planar tetrahedral uh, trigonal bipyramidal so that when you start replacing your uh, bonding regions with lone pairs there's a, all these new names and all these new geometries that we're going to need to consider um, all of these slides are going to be posted on our support site, so you'll be able to take a look and see at them as well. So if you have any questions at this time, please let me know uh, and stick around because part two of Vesper is uh, going to be here on YouTube. And I strongly recommend that you watch it because this is that part two is going to start taking into consideration uh, things that aren't as ideal as what we just walked through on the video. Thanks for watching and uh, have a great day.